online MMO. Online MMO. Yeah. Okay. But I don't. World of Warcraft or. Okay. Yes. Warcraft World of Warcraft. Or. I used to play a lot back in the days. Sure. Because my father owned like a gaming club in my country, but now I don't have that much time. But I used to play like Counter Strike, any action games, any RPG, Diablo. Two okay. was for the longest time. Heroes of Might and Magic. Do you have your sick week scheduled for Diablo three coming out later? This oh, week? I already finished the beta. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and and would you consider yourself the typical market audience for an RPG? I would say so. You would think so. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I know. I mean, based on the game, when you look at the game, you want to make sure it's. I mean, of course, got the great graphics, first of all, that you look. Got the great gameplay. I mean, if you have a game without the real story, then what would you want to play? Sure. Like, there's no fun. Sure. So, that's how I usually base my games on. Sure. To try. So there used to be a class offered here that you and I talked about real quick. Um, because I was, when I asked to speak here, I asked to speak at that class. Um, <laughs> it was, like I said, I forget the title of, of the course. It's no longer offered here. But the course book for that course, I could probably send to Rebecca and, um, and she could share it out. But it talked about what makes a, a good game versus a not a good game. And it's a lot of it's the, the immersion experience. And whether that's great graphics or a great story, or you can have a great game that's based on a story that doesn't necessarily look fulfilling. Um, it's not going to market well, but but they have had text muds from 20 years ago are that way. You know, well, text, text based mud games. Well, there's Minecraft. <coughs> What's it? Minecraft. Another great example. Way too addicting. All of them. For the phone, for consoles, for computers, for the next generation of computers, for Windows 8, um, for touch enabled devices, for you name it. What's the difference between the codes for computers and the games for keyboards? The difference of the languages? Well, there's really none. Um, there is a little bit of a difference when you're looking at, at phone. Um, but there's, there's programs out there that help you port from one platform to the next or develop for each platform simultaneously. Each platform, whether it be a phone or a PC or a console. So I'm assuming you test games for Kinect too? Yes. Connect is is a big push right now from Microsoft, and yes, I do have some games that utilize Connect features as well as our full blown Connect control. What's Connect? <laughs> You're really new to the to the games talk, aren't you? Okay. Um, so Connect is a, a motion game. You use your body as the controller. Like we. No. Better. There's no word about it. Different. Different. I'm, he's, he's correct. I'm partial. I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, it's, it's a camera and, uh, and infrared um, sensing device. So the device lays out and maps you with, um, with a bunch of points, infrared points. And then a camera receives those points and interprets that into your control. So whether it be football, you're throwing the ball, to running, to petting a cat, to anything. Uh, what's the minimum knowledge required to be a beginner in Microsoft? To be what? Uh, to apply for internships. To apply for internships? Yeah. Uh, for an internship, I think you need a four-year degree, depending on the internship. Um, you need a four-year degree, and or in the middle of a four-year degree. You know, you could be doing your.
your summer internship in your sophomore year. Every position is different. Um, and so I can't, I mean, Microsoft is a huge corporation. Um, so I can't answer that for every position. The group I work with doesn't have any internships. Um, but generally, they look for programming knowledge, whether it be you know C++ or um, uh, C Sharp or object-oriented programming in general, just knowledge of it. I can't sit down myself. I'm not a programmer. I'm, I don't work as a developer. I don't sit down and just write hundreds of lines of code like some people do. But I can write code. So it's saying what's the minimum it is. It's more about, at Microsoft at least, it's more about the individual and the individual's capabilities to fit within that job than it is about what you have on your resume. Programming languages, a college degree, all of that's going to help. Um, but it's not necessarily the only thing. It's more about tenacity. I interviewed four full interview loops in four years. I got hires on every one of them before I landed my job. So, and all of them for the same team. It, the first one was I got all hires and so did the other guy and they wanted someone that was sitting in the position so they hired the contractor that was sitting in the position. The second time they wanted someone, um, or no, that was the second time. The first time, I was, I still knew the position, I had just left, and they wanted someone that was fresh eyes, and I wasn't fresh eyes. The second time was they wanted someone that knew it, had no training time, could just port right over to the job. I'd been out of Microsoft or out of position for two and a half years, and so I didn't do it. Um, the third one was a completely different position. I got all hires, but they decided not to hire for the for the head, and then the fourth time was the one that I landed. So, it tenacity, you know, showing how well-rounded you are, how willing you are to roll with the punches, but how much you want the position, and how much you can fulfill the position as well.
I don't see a shift happening anytime soon, though, as far as practices across the industry to go one way or another. Sorry? That people the job outside Well, we do some of that, too. I mean, Uh, constantly shifting. How's that? <laughs> um, like I said earlier, too, uh, we have, I have a, um, a partnership with an external vendor that does the majority of our hands-on testing. There's 80 testers down in Portland that aren't Microsoft employees, but they're on Microsoft contract that do the majority of our black box play test for my product. Sometimes it's a contractor internally. Um, if you're looking at games, it's really about having a butt in the chair with a set of eyes looking at a screen and playing it. But there is a lot of automation that's done as well and can be done from overseas. Um, and if it can be done cheaper and when we're talking software, it's not a matter of um, having a physical device to pick up and move around with. It's something that can be sent over an FTP and at the end of my workday, and it's not the beginning of India's workday. They can get started on it as soon as they show up for work and report on it at the end of their day, and it's back to me first thing in the morning. Um, some of my partnerships on, on game development, some of my game developers are, I've got one in Finland right now, one in Spain, and one in France as well as producers that I have to work with that are in England. And so our time schedules are shifted. Those producers are Microsoft employees, but those developers are not. They are each their own company. And so some of that does occur all over the world, especially software. Um, where did you say you were from? Russia. Russia. There's a ton of I, game development. I met a lot of people who were traveling, um, and they worked at the retail, and they were stopping by, and they're like, oh, if you're visiting Microsoft, they're on a visa because we work for them. Right. But they're actually working back in that country. Right. And it's, there's a tremendous amount of developers out of Russia, um, Belarus, uh, all over the Ukraine and the former Eastern Bloc countries, um, and some great stuff coming out of those areas. Um, so it, it happens all over the world. To really say what the trend is, <coughs> differentiates from project to project, from project manager to project manager. Um, some managers want full control, depending on the timeline or the project. Some managers are willing to work with the time shift and differential. So. Sure. So, for somebody that's interested in possibly going to Microsoft, like myself, I have a four-year degree, um, and I'm at the beginning, uh, first quarter of the web application programming okay. degree. Um, in addition to that degree, what, uh, I guess what advice or what recommendations would you have as far as other things that, other training that might be beneficial as well as that, or do you think this program is going to be enough to train me to get, get my foot in Well, okay, so you're in web application, right? And um, I'm assuming it's a certificate course? Um, yeah, right now I'm doing the database uh, this quarter. But like I said, it's my first <coughs> quarter, so I still don't know what else, you know, what else is going to be down the road in the, in the program. Sure. So I'm kind of curious, as somebody who's been through that program, maybe it was a little different. What things do you see that you know I might need to pick up elsewhere along the way? To oh, okay, okay. So, um, personal recommendations. Not this is not an official. None of what I say here either is a, in an official. I work for Microsoft capacity. Sure. This is all me as a person and my individual experiences. So one of the testing things I did before I got into games was I tested MCSE coursework. Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, okay. or no, Microsoft System MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer coursework for Windows 2000 before Windows 2000 shipped. 
and it was tremendously beneficial to me in 99 and 2000 to, to test those courses because when Windows 2000 came out the door and the adoption rate of business, um, I was ultimately marketable to the company I worked for as a tester. So all of our clients be, that were adopting Windows 2000 because I knew it before anyone else did. Microsoft is very much in a move forward mentality as are most major corporations. And the best thing I can think of that you could do is not only work on what's currently available, but look at as much as you can, look at the next generation to see how you can use that because they use everything now as their stepping stone to what they expose next. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if you can find out in some way, shape, or form who's doing Windows 8 uh, certification testing of, of the classroom setups and whatnot, you might be able to pick up a part-time job doing that and get exposed to, to Windows 8 in those respects. Or try to get on the consumer preview download a copy of beta, get into beta programs. Um, even if you're not currently and consistently giving feedback, at least you're being exposed to it. How is this working with what I know now, right? And whether that be, if you're looking at web application development, what's the next version of SharePoint or Microsoft Cloud Services? And again, you know, do that. How can you currently apply it to not only what's currently available, but what Microsoft has said publicly that they're doing. I think we're almost about out of time. Sure. Um, is there, there's a one more question, maybe? Or not? Do you want to? Oh, I just heard that cloud computing is going to put Microsoft out of business. Mm -hmm. per personal opinion, mm -hmm. because Microsoft's there too. Xbox Live is storing to the cloud. Um, you can share your save from system to system with a lot of what my team is doing is through the cloud. Microsoft's in cloud computing fully up to about here, you know. Um, and so is it going to put them out of business? Um, people are the the studies on the broad scale that Microsoft has looked at with cloud computing and, and what's going on there is people are still going to want to have physical access to their files. The power goes out and you have a battery still, you know, and now you can get to your files. Whereas if they're all on cloud, so if you can't connect to, to the cloud server, you're not going to be able to get what's yours. Thanks for having me. Sorry I was...